friends welcome back to Shomu's biology and in this series of videos we are actually talking about the cellular respiration and different stages of cellular respiration in the last three videos we talked about the overview of respiration then glycolysis then PDH and this video we are going to talk about Krebs cycle because this is the third and one of the most important steps of cellular respiration one thing we should always know that Krebs cycle involved in the cellular respiration scheme if the process is undergoing aerobic mode of respiration. If the process is anaerobic then we don't have any Krebs cycle in the scheme of cellular respiration. Because in anaerobic mode we only take the product of glycolysis that is pyruvate and then it's converted to either lactate or it's converted to ethanol. Lactate in case of animal cells, in case of us, ethanol in case of prokaryotes. So now if we look at here in the third step, that is the Krebs cycle in oxidative mode or aerobic mode. Because this step requires oxidation of acetyl-CoA. And not only the oxidation of acetyl-CoA, but oxidation of further downstream products that are going to be produced from acetyl-CoA. So acetyl-CoA is being oxidized to other molecules, other products and they are further converted and oxidized. And then ultimately what we produce is we produce NADH, FADH2. Now this NADH or FADH2, these are energy carrying molecules and they are produced as a result of oxidization of acetyl-CoA. Now in this case, as we know, that oxidation never goes single. Whenever oxidation is working, along with that, it always works of reduction. So this is a redox reaction, whatever we are thinking of. So if we are looking at the oxidation of acetyl-CoA into some other substrates, there are definitely some other molecules that should be reduced. And the molecules taken for this reduction are this NAD and FAD. They are reduced into the form called NADH and FADH2. And that is the idea. So the thing here is we oxidize acetyl-CoA and the subsequent products while we are reducing NAD and FAD into NADH and FADH2 so that we can use NADH and FADH2 as an electron donor for the last round or last step of the cellular respiration in aerobic mode that is electron transport chain and these electron donors will help us to generate more and more ATP molecules because that is our ultimate goal for the cellular respiration. We want to generate energy. That's why when you eat a food you get energized. Because if you have glucose inside your body, your body will start degrading and breaking it into pyruvate. Then that pyruvate is going to be converted into acetyl-CoA. Then acetyl-CoA taken in Krebs cycle, converted and produce more and more NADH and FADH2. And if oxygen is adequate in your body, then this NADH and FADH2 will pass it through the electron transport chain. They transfer their electron. That will help us to generate more and more ATP means more and more energy that's how it works so in the Krebs cycle process you will see this is a multi-step process with numerous enzymes and you need to remember all their names which we will see in the second part of this video and we'll see each and every single steps in details but if you look at here like the glycolysis Krebs cycles also contain some unidirectional uh, stages and some bidirectional stages. The unidirectional stages uh, are the steps which are regulatory steps. You cannot go back pretty easily. Another thing about the Krebs cycle is where it works and why we need that. I think you all understand why we need Krebs cycle by now because without Krebs cycle the aerobic respiration will not generate the electron donors such as NADH and FADH2. That's its importance. The second part, that's where it works, Krebs cycle always works inside the matrix of mitochondria. 
So if you look at a matrix, I recently deleted the, the, the picture. In the last video, I already drew uh, the picture of mitochondria. So let's look at here. It will look something like this. So this is the matrix of mitochondria. Now we know once the pyruvate is produced after glycolysis, pyruvate is taken directly inside the matrix with the help of transported proteins that are present on the mitochondrial membrane. Now once pyruvate is entered into the matrix of mitochondria, then it is converted into acetyl-CoA. And once it produces acetyl-CoA there, this acetyl-CoA is taken in Krebs cycle in multiple stages in the mitochondrial matrix and they will produce NADH and FADH2 at the end of Krebs cycle which are also present in the mitochondrial matrix. Because now you will see this last step of cellular respiration or electron transport chain that thing occurs in the membrane, membrane of mitochondria and we need NADH and FADH2 in the matrix of mitochondria for electron transport chain to occur properly and we also need the presence of oxygen for this process to properly occur. So these are the complete steps. Now if you see the second part of this detailed stages, you will see actually in the process of Krebs cycle, we never generate any single molecule of ATP. It's not generated. Only one molecule of GTP is generated and actually two molecules of GTP are generated. But no molecules of ATP is generated in Krebs cycle. But still, after the Krebs cycle, we produce many more NADH and FADH2 that are further energetic compared to ATP. Because you will see one molecule of NADH is going to give you approximately 2.5 or 3 ATP molecules generated after electron transport chain. While one molecule of FADH2 is going to help you generate 1.5 or you can say 2 molecules of ATP after electron transport chain. And that's what makes it really important for Krebs cycle to continue. So now let's look at each and every single steps of Krebs cycle and how they are regulated. Okay guys, now we are going to see an animation regarding the process of electron transport in mitochondrial membrane. You know in mitochondrial inner membrane we have four different complex of proteins which are embedded which are performed and involved with the tasks of electron transport and ultimately uh, converting it to the water at the end by attaching with hydrogen while oxidizing NADH and FADH2 to generate substantial amount of energy as ATP molecules. Now in this case we will see only the role of three complexes which are directly present in the inner membrane of mitochondria. One is complex 1, complex 2 and complex 3. We will see what are they made up with, what are their structures and we will also see the number of protons they pump out into the intermembrane space and the number of electrons they carry and we also talk about the mobile electron carriers which is quenzyme Q and cytochrome C. Let's talk about it. The complex 1 transports electron from NADH to quenzyme Q. It contains more than 40 protein subunits and a bound flavin mononucleotide, so the FMN site. And it contains numerous iron sulfur centers. It translocates two protons to the intermembrane space per NADH oxidized. So for a single NADH, four protons will be pumped into the intermembrane space. Now let's move to the next, that is complex number three which accepts electron from reduced coenzyme Q and transports them to the cytochrome C. It contains 11 protein subunits and 3 cytochrome regions, 1 iron sulfur center. It translocates 4 protons per 2 electrons are transferred to cytochrome C. Now if you look at here, each cytochrome C accepts only one electron. So for transferring two electrons, we need two cytochrome C in this place. Now the last one and complex 4 known as cytochrome C oxidase accepts electrons from reduced cytochrome C and transport them to the molecular oxygen for reduction of it into water. It contains 13 protein subunits, two cytochromes and one copper site. 
it translocates two protons or two electrons and also consumes two protons from the matrix in generating one molecule of water from half molecules of oxygen. Now let's talk about the coupling of electron transport and ATP synthesis. As I told you earlier that this process of ATP synthesis worked in a two-step way. The first thing is the electron transport across the mitochondrial membrane. Okay, that will help us to generate proton gradient across the inner membrane of mitochondria. And, and the second thing is uh, the rotation of the rotor unit of uh, ATP synthase enzyme to produce ATP by combining ADP with inorganic phosphate. And there is a link between these two processes that is known as the coupling of electron transport chain and ATP synthesis. The electron transport occurs along the mitochondrial inner membrane. Now the electron transport complex 1, 3 and 4 translocates protons to the intermembrane space. This helps to generate a proton electrochemical gradient negative in matrix by building a high concentration of protons in the intermembrane space. The high concentration of protons in the intermembrane space contributes to the proton electrochemical gradient that drives ATP synthesis by complex number 5 or ATP synthase enzyme. During the ATP synthesis, protons are returned to the matrix and ADP is combined with inorganic phosphate to make ATP. Now earlier we saw that after the electron transport chain, there is complex 5 or also known as ATP synthase. The, it has a motor unit and a stator unit that holds it together. The rotor unit start rotating and start attaching ADP with inorganic phosphate to convert it into the ATP. But the question is how exactly this motor works. Let's look at that in much more details. F1 has three chemical units. F1 is a part of this ATP synthesis and three chemically identical units but conformationally distinct and distinct based on the alpha beta protomers. Each protomer has one catalytic site for ATP synthesis. Now on the other hand if you look at this O, O is the open conformation which has a very low affinity for the substrates or products. Then L is L conformation binds with ligands loosely and then finally the T, T conformation binds ligands very tightly. So L for loose, T for tight, O for the open. So let's look at it. The first step is ADP and PI binds to the L site. An input of energy drives the conformational change that converts L site to T. Now site T to O and the site O to L. So there is a sequential shift between the sites. Because the T site had the ATP bound and the energy was used to change it to an O site, the ATP was released. Thus the energy is not used to synthesize the ATP but to release it from a tightly bound site. The conformational change is driven by the gamma subunit which is designated by the central green object listed here. As ATP is released from the new O site, another molecule of ATP is formed spontaneously at the new T site. After the two such sequences, the enzyme has returned to its initial state. So just look at this process again and again, you will understand the stuff. So let's look at it again. It will rotate, spontaneous change, formation of ATP and then the change of L to T T to O, O to L. That's how the process start continuing ATP release and that's the end. So if you like this video, please hit the like button, subscribe to my channel to make it grow and also make more and more videos like this for you and also share this video with every friend and also in every social networking sites. Thank you.